Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, especially on such a beautiful, sunny afternoon. Um, we could all be outside enjoying some sunshine, so I'm really impressed by the um, number of people who have turned out to think about this political moment. Um, so this is our flash panel on the impeachment inquiry. The School of History, Philosophy, and Religion created flash panels like this one as a way to provide students with information and analysis about current events and important national developments. Our goal is to provide essential expert, nonpartisan analysis of some of the most pressing, pressing issues in the world today to our students and to our community. We've held panels on the occupation of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge, on changes to US immigration policy, and on the mass shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Philadelphia. In this particular panel event about the impeachment inquiry, we intend to represent all sides of the historical, political, and legal issues related to impeachment. For our panel, we are drawing on the expertise of OSU professors in the fields of political science, law, history, international affairs, with additional expertise from our local representative for this district, who also holds a graduate degree from this institution, on citizen rights and responsibilities. These are tense times. I would remind everyone that this is an educational forum. As faculty in the liberal arts, we absolutely believe that people of goodwill can discuss sensitive issues calmly and rationally. Indeed, for the health of our democracy, it is essential that we discuss difficult topics, that we apply the insights of experts to complex issues, and that we keep respect for each other in the forefront of our interactions. So today, each panelist will offer 10 minutes or so of commentary, and then we'll have time for you to post questions to the panelists. As I'm sure many of you have questions, we want the Q&A to be as efficient as possible, so if you have a question you would like to ask, please write it, legibly, because I will be reading it, um, on one of the available cards. We will collect the cards at the end of the panel presentations, and then we will go through the process of reading them and having the panel respond. I would like to thank those who have made this panel possible, starting with our sponsorship partners, the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, the Center for the Humanities, and the Citizenship and Crisis Initiative. Special thank you also to Nicole Von Vermitten, Larry Rogers, Chris Nichols, Suzanne Giftai, and Natalia Bueno for their support and assistance. And a special thanks to Senator Sarah Gelser for generously giving her time to be part of this panel on a lovely afternoon. I would like to invite Larry Rogers, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, to offer a few words, and then I will introduce our panelists. Thanks all. Uh, I'm indeed uh, Larry Rogers, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. And I'm really, really pleased that all of you are here. I think this event is, in uh, one sense, I think interesting to me because, like you, I'm a citizen curious about wanting to learn more about an issue of relevance, high relevance in the Amer current American political discourse. It's a hot button current issue. And we're in a moment, I think, of heightened social and political turmoil as we try to work through this hot button issue. But it's also exciting to me because this kind of gathering models the university and our College of Liberal Arts in a role where I believe it shines as a place that presents ideas and issues in a fact-based, historically informed forum and that encourages people to discuss the issues that are on the table. This happens all the time in the classroom. Now it's happening in a classroom, but indeed in an attempt to also reach a broader audience. No place is the College of Liberal Arts mission more aligned, I think, with that of Oregon State University as a whole than in the way that it embraces its role of purposeful outreach of engaging relevant issues, concerns, and challenges, and incorporating them not only into the classroom and areas of research focus, but also, and here is where we shine, and here is where I think Oregon State is different from lots and lots of other R1 universities, in its understanding of the important role we play sharing our expertise, giving it a public area. Impeachment may be the single most hot button issue in the American political moment. Taking a position on whether you're for it, 
feeling like perhaps it can't happen soon enough, if you're against it, or somewhere in between is only the very beginning of identifying a complex map of impressions, attitudes, and beliefs around the topic, both in the present as it came into public view, and around presidents, of course, Andrew Johnson, around Richard Nixon, around Bill Clinton. If we're a university and a college that imagine that this is something our political scientists study, but don't bring into public conversation, as in they write books and they publish articles, but they don't talk about it right now, or if our historians wait to write books only through a backward-looking <coughs> historical lens, we are not fulfilling our mission. Our role in helping to foster informed, thoughtful, sometimes contentious debate in a respectful and factor in a way, this is what universities do. It's what grounds the principles of free speech. And this kind of conversation, honoring the full complexity of challenging complex topics like this, is the lifeblood of our college. So I want to thank our School of History, Philosophy, and Religion for putting this together. I want to thank our state senator for District 8, Sarah Gelser, for agreeing to join the forum. And I want to thank all of you, our attendees, for having enough, enough interest, I think, in this important topic, that it's Friday afternoon, you have lots of choices, and you say, you know what, I really want to be there at this. So welcome, and let's get started. And now I'll briefly introduce our panelists. Rory Solberg is an associate professor of political science in the School of Public Policy who teaches constitutional law and judicial politics. Her research examines the dynamics of federal and circuit courts. Professor Solberg will address constitutional and processual aspects of impeachment. Up next will be Steve Shea, who's a senior instructor of history in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. He teaches courses in US history with an emphasis on civic discourse. Steve Shea's research examines social and political movements in the 20th century US West and Professor Shea will offer a comparative historical review of presidential impeachments. Christopher McKnight Nichols is an associate professor of history in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, who teaches American thought and culture and the diplomatic history of the US. While his research explores the intellectual history of the role of US in the world, he also keeps very busy as director of the OSU Center for the Humanities, while also appearing on NPR, OPD, and writing for the Washington Post, Politico, the Chicago Sun-Times, and a host of other publications. And he's been, as you imagine, very busy the last few weeks. <laughs> Professor Nichols will explore unique elements of this specific impeachment inquiry with an eye toward foreign policy. Finally, last but not least, Sarah Gelser is a member of the Oregon State Senate, representing District 8, which includes Corvallis, Albany, Philomath, Millersburg, and Tangent. She is chair of the State Human Services Committee and also serves on the Judiciary Committee, the Education Committee, the Mental Health Committee, and the Joint Transportation Committee. She's also so busy. <laughs> Senator Gelser holds a master's degree in interdisciplinary studies with an emphasis in history from OSU. Senator Gelser will, applaud, will address the roles that citizen opinion, electoral math, and the 24-hour news cycle play in discussions taking place among elected representatives. So at first we have Lori Solberg. Uh, thank you, Amy and thank you, Amy Rogers, for the kind introduction and, and sort of setting the stage for us. My role here today is to really provide an overview of the impeachment process, how it operates, and, and some of the, the constitutional questions that we might um, want to address here. So first thing, I wanted to sort of set the stage in the sense that the impeachment process was placed into the Constitution by the framers. Um, as part and parcel of that system of checks and balances that was so unique at the time of our founding. Um, if you recall, the framers didn't want an overly powerful executive branch, right? They had just sort of sloughed off the chains of the monarchy. Um, and they put in this check in the system in case it was imprudent to wage or necessary to remove an official before the next election or if that official wasn't removable via election. It's fairly clear from the writings of the time and the notes taken during the convention that even though the founders instituted a system that seems to be quite similar to the criminal justice system, that impeachment was really not about violating laws. That impeachment was a political process rather than a legal process. 
Um, the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors we tend today to think about really, it just again puts us into mind of the criminal justice system. But at the time of the founding, that was a term of art that really was thought about as abuses of power or abuses of public trust. So that kind of sets the stage. So the impeachment is a political remedy, again, not necessarily a criminal or a legal one, although it can be um, used in instances of criminal activity. And that was one of the reasons, or the main reason, why the founders ceded control over impeachment in the legislative branch rather than in the judicial branch. Because it was thought to be a political process, and so they placed it in a political branch. Second, who can be impeached, right? We have a good sense that a president can be impeached, but it's also the vice president and any other civil official in the United States is what the Constitution says. In reality, that means the president, the vice president, federal judges, and historically cabinet officials. But really, only 18 people have ever been impeached in the United States, in the history of the United States, and only eight have been removed from office. And all of those removed from office thus far have been federal judges. Two presidents, Johnson and Clinton, which Professor Shea will discuss, one secretary of war, and 15 federal judges um, have been impeached. The last one to be impeached and removed was actually just a, you know, a few years ago in 2010. <coughs> um, it was G. Thomas Porteous Jr who was impeached and removed for committing perjury and signing false financial disclosures. All right, so last, which will take longer. How does impeachment work? Well, it's a two-stage process, right? The Constitution seeks half of the process in the House of Representatives and half of the process in the Senate. The first part of the process, impeachment, again, goes to the House. And impeachment is basically an investigation to determine if wrongs have been committed, maybe criminal wrongs or political wrongs. It is, again, similar to the criminal justice system um, uh, in terms of an indictment or an information, depending on what kind of state you're in. And if the House, after investigation, believes that impeachable offenses, offenses have been committed, they will then write up articles of impeachment. Similar to, again, the way a prosecutor um, after a grand jury would write up an indictment. Uh, articles of impeachment set out the charges against the official. If they are passed by the House with only a simple majority, then that officer of the United States is impeached. Um, so to go along again with this analogy, which is not a great one because it gets us a little confused of the criminal justice process, um, it is, again, similar to that indictment, right? There's a sense that there might be wrongdoing that's happened. There's someone who believes they can prove it. But nothing has been proven. Nothing goes further than that. Right? It doesn't mean the individual is guilty, nor does it mean um, that a majority of the House believes that they should be removed from office, but they believe there is enough there to move forward. Now, in terms of how the House handles this process, because this is something that's been in the news a lot, the Constitution sets out no rules. To be very clear about this, the Constitution says impeachment, the sole power over impeachment is in the House, and that's about it. So the process that the House goes through is a combination of historical precedent and the choices of the current members of the House of Representatives. The Congressional Research Service even offers us a summary of the rules of impeachment, and there's three of them. The process is initiated. Okay. The Judiciary Committee in, uh, investigates and writes up articles of impeachment, and the House votes. That's it. And again, those don't come from the Constitution. That's them gleaning it from historical precedent. Anyone in the House can actually initiate impeachment. A single member can initiate and place articles of impeachment in the hopper of the House. Uh, Presidents Truman, Reagan, H.W., G.W. Bush, and Obama had articles of impeachment drawn up against them with none of the processes that we're seeing now. Um, but there was no investigation. There was no continued part of the process. So in other words, 
factually speaking, Nancy Pelosi, as Speaker of the House, is well within her power to start the ball rolling, um, including assigning three different committees to do some of the investigation. Would it be prudent for them to have a vote and a resolution? In all likelihood, yes it would, because this is going to end up in the courts, and having a House resolution with the majority of the House saying, yes, we want an investigation, would, would give them a stronger case. But they don't have to, because there's nothing in the Constitution that says. All right, so if these committees find there's enough evidence, again, for impeachable offenses, they write out their articles of impeachment, the list of wrongs, they report it out to the House, there's a vote, and if a majority of the House says yes, it then moves over to the Senate, because the Senate has the sole authority over the trial. The trial, again, um, and again, beyond that, there's really no rules in the Constitution. It's two-thirds, they say two-thirds of the majority of the Senate to convict in this trial, and the only uh, punishments that are allowed are removal from <coughs> office and forbidding someone to, to hold office again. Right? So it's not a criminal trial. There's not going to be a sentencing or anything like that. Okay. Um, now, I kind of feel like I should backtrack a little bit. There's been a lot of discussion also in the news about whether the House actually has the power to investigate a president. And despite the rhetoric, the facts are that absolutely, constitutionally speaking, the House has the power to investigate. It's considered an implied constitutional power deriving directly from the legislative authority seated in Congress from the Constitution. Congress has been conducting investigations since the founding, since the 1790s. Congress, the Supreme Court has said, can investigate as long as the area of inquiry is one that relates to legislation. And by analogy to impeachment, since that's a power granted to Congress under the Constitution. Um, if, something, if it's something Congress might write a law about, again, they can investigate. This comes from a case from 1881. And in 1927, again, the court determined that Congress also has the power to issue subpoenas to compel testimony of private individuals, because as the court noted, if Congress only waited or relied upon um, volunteered information, they would get a very skewed picture and wouldn't be able to legislate well. So the court says absolutely the power to investigate, absolutely the power to compel. Compel. In fact, Congress used to actually have somebody who would arrest people who were in, who refused to, to appear. And they had a jail cell in the basement of Congress to place those folks. That hasn't been done for a while. I'm sure my historian colleagues will, will talk maybe more about that. Um, so since the time, again, since the Constitution tasks the House with the sole power of impeachment, the power to investigate attaches to that process, and all of these precedents apply, right? Um, the House must be able to investigate and compel testimony and compel documents in order to determine whether impeachable offenses have occurred. Otherwise, they can't do their constitutional duty. And the House has a stronger claim for this kind of compulsion in impeachment because that process is given to them again in the document. Given the position of the White House of non-compliance at this point, I don't think anything's changed in the last few hours, um, the various committees will be left with no choice but to issue subpoenas to compel records and testimony. When these are ignored, as it seems like they are likely to be, the fight will move to the courts. Um, it will be a bit more complicated than those cases uh, that I cited earlier because the president will be exerting what is called executive privilege. However, thus far, historically speaking, the Supreme Court has never been particularly amenable to a blanket claim of executive privilege, which this is. It's, you don't get anything, right? Any testimony, any documents, anything. It's just blanketing the entire bureaucracy with executive privilege, right? And that's a, that's a pretty, pretty tall order for the courts to, to swallow. Um, and while the courts absolutely hate dealing with these issues of executive privilege and these, and these conflicts between Congress and the president, um, if a stalemate is reached, if the two branches do not come to an agreement on how they will proceed as they did during the Clinton impeachment, say, 
um, then they will step in. And again, lower court precedent has ruled that if Congress can show that they have a need for the documents, then executive privilege can fail. Um, executive privilege is a qualified privilege. It's not an absolute one. Um, okay, back to stage two, the trial. What that means is it's not a criminal trial, but it looks kind of like one. Uh, there are prosecutors, but they're members of the House. They're the managers of the impeachment. They come over to the Senate. Um, they're appointed by the House, and they present the case to the senators who sit as the jury, right? Um, the official who has been impeached may have a defense. There may be cross-examination. There may be exhibits. So all the things that uh, President Trump's, one of his attorneys, placed in his letter saying, this is the due process that I deserve, that's correct. But historically, precedentially, that due process occurs during the trial, not during the investigation. Um, but even though it looks and kind of feels like a criminal trial, again, it isn't, right? If it's a presidential impeachment, first of all, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court presides, right? So it sits, sits behind everything and gets to bang the gavel and do something besides what he does over at the court. However, it doesn't really have any power, right? The Chief Justice can rule on issues of procedure, but any decision made by the Chief Justice can be overturned by a, a majority vote of the Senate because the Senate has the sole power over impeachment by majority rule. They determine the rules of the process. Um, this is how the Constitution, or at least how the Supreme Court has interpreted it, right? So um, a second major difference between a criminal trial, like most of us have watched enough cop shows, we know that you have to prove things beyond a reasonable doubt. Not in an impeachment, right? In an impeachment, um, as the Congressional Research Service notes, the Senate has declined to establish a standard, leaving it a matter for the conscience of each senator. What this means is each senator chooses which legal standard they want to apply. And I tried to find a lot of some corrobor corroboration for this because I have this memory of this happening during the Clinton impeachment, and maybe someone else can, can say, yes, you're right. But the Democrats and the Republicans during the Clinton impeachment trial used different standards. Right? The Democrats demanded that the managers of the House prove, prove, uh, prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Clinton engaged in impeachable offenses, whereas the Republicans just wanted a preponderance of evidence, a much lower standard, because each individual senator gets to choose for themselves. That doesn't happen at a criminal trial. Right? Um, it's also true that the entire Senate doesn't have to sit as a jury in an impeachment trial. Now, in all likelihood, during a presidential one, they would. But however, in a 1992 Supreme Court case, Nixon uh, v. U.S., not that Nixon, though. <laughs> this was a federal judge, um, made a claim that his impeachment trial was unconstitutional because he was tried by a committee of the Senate. And this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court looked at it and said, hmm, the Constitution says the Senate has the sole power to try impeachment. Nixon said, yeah, try, so the Senate has to try me as a whole. And the court said, no, that means the Senate gets to figure it out and how to do it however they want. This is not a question for us to answer. This is given to the, by the, from the, con the Constitution gives this over to the senators, so they can choose how they want it to happen. So anytime someone comes in and says that impeachment has to go this way, trial has to happen this way, no. Well, institution gets to choose for itself. Um, and again, this was a unanimous decision. So, this is my little bit on impeachment. Um, so as long as the Senate follows a few guidelines in the document, two-thirds of a vote, and only tries to remove someone from office, as long as the House in some form or fashion goes through impeachment, they follow the Constitution. Um, so the rules, again, are completely up to the House and then the Senate for each inquiry. All right, well, thank you all for being here today. And it's wonderful to serve on such a uh, great panel that uh, basically sets things up for one another. Um, there has never been a clean impeachment in history. Each impeachment has its own particular uh, 
items and elements that mix things up. And so I wanted to look at the impeachment that I thought was probably the craziest so far in American history, and I had my choice of two. <laughs> and that is the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Um, so this is the case study that I'm looking at. We can see so many of what, uh, examples of what Professor Solberg brought forward. The context of Andrew Johnson becoming president of the United States was that the United States was still in the midst of a devastating war. A president had been assassinated, and Johnson himself had been the target of an assassination. There was huge economic change in the United States, lots of manufacturing in the North that had not existed prior to the war, and the South, of course, had its agricultural system of slave labor that was in ruins. The question of racial superiority of white people was in question, and this is part of the ferment that leads to impeachment. For today, I want to focus on four R's. The first one is resentment. The second one is race, radicals, and reconstruction. Those are the four R's. First for the resentment. Andrew Johnson was a singular individual in the history of the presidency. He's the only president that served as an indentured servant. He took advantage of the egalitarian politics of the time that were open to all free white males, and he entered politics. He was most famous for haranguing against the plantation owners and their power, and yet once he was wealthy enough, he purchased slaves of his own. Lincoln selected him to balance the ticket in the presidential election of 1864 because he was the only Southern senator that remained in Washington, D.C. He was still part of the Democratic Party, the so-called war Democrat uh, wing of the party, who wanted to pursue the war as a source of change. And similar to Lincoln, he has these kind of humble origins. And both men agreed on the idea that the best way to solve the racial problem of the United States was to colonize African Americans somewhere else. So uh, these two men are not quite as, as different in their policy towards African Americans. Prior to his assassination, the big controversy uh, between Congress and Lincoln was over how to uh, reconstruct the United States. For Lincoln, the argument was that the states had never left the Union, it was an internal rebellion, so the reconstruction should be presidential, it should be quick, and it should be generous to get those governments functioning again and allow those democratic institutions to flourish. Congress's growing Republican majority, however, saw things differently. They thought that the Confederate States of America had actually seceded from the nation, became an independent nation, and now a treaty was required to bring the Confederate States back. That meant that Congress would control Reconstruction, it would be slow, and there would be an element of punishing the South for their treason. Whatever similarities may have existed between Lincoln and Johnson, Lincoln was flexible, kind, and brilliant. Johnson is, you will see, not so much. Johnson acted on Lincoln's argument, and he, experienced, he expected the deference of Congress. He largely kept uh, Lincoln's cabinet intact, as well as military commanders, and he sought the favor of those military commanders. He acted by presidential order, did not seek congressional, uh, to bring Congress back into session, and he began pardoning Confederates at an alarming rate to many in Congress. He sought to reestablish the southern states by executive order with those states re-entering the Union with no guarantee of civil rights for freed men and women. In speeches, Johnson stated, and I quote, everyone must and would admit that the white race is superior to the black. He also warned that equality in the nation would bring about, and I quote, the Mexicanizing of half the nation. The result was in an election in late 1865 that brought four former Confederate officers to Congress, seven former Confederate Congress members to Congress, and three members of the secessionist conventions that voted to leave the Union. Congress chose not to seat those members and sparked Johnson's anger. Enter into the equation the radicals. This group was not a coherent group of Republicans or even the majority. But they did believe that the war should be fought to emancipate slave, slavery, and after the war, that black rights were essential to reconstruction efforts. Otherwise, those former slaves would simply uh, be reconstituted in another labor system that was slavery by another name. There was increasing violence across the South in 1866 against the radical Republicans' ideas. 
The most extreme examples were a series of riots in Memphis, Tennessee, and New Orleans, Louisiana. For three days in Memphis, mobs of white civilians and policemen ransacked the African American community. 48 people were killed, 75 injured, hundreds of robbings, five rapes, and a tremendous property loss. In July and August, in New Orleans, 44 people were killed, 150 injured, and three white Republicans were injured as well. In the wake of these events, Johnson attempted to generate support for his policies, which was essentially let the South back in and let them govern locally. He wanted to go on a nationwide tour to speak to Americans directly. His cabinet asked him not to go, but he went anyway. On stage, he frequently appeared to be drunk and wildly genuflecting. Uh, he recommended hanging members of Congress. He said that he, indeed, was the black man's Moses. The two races, black and white, were natural enemies, he said. And, quote, if turned loose upon each other, thrown together at the ballot box with enmity and hate, then there would be a racial war in the United States. Members of the radical Republicans saw this as an erosion of civil rights that was being asserted by the president, but not all Republicans felt the same. A group of Republicans that were, are called the liberal Republicans, led by James Garfield of Ohio, when they heard these worries about Johnson, uh, Garfield said, quote, some foolish men amongst us are all the while bristling up for a fight with the president. We seem anxious for a rupture with Johnson. I think that we should assume that he is with us, treat him kindly, without suspicion, and go on in a firm, calmly considered course. Republicans were also aware that in areas of the United States that today we consider very uh, pro-civil rights, that actually in the elections of 1866, three of those northern states had rejected allowing the voting for African American men, Connecticut, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And so, Congressional Republicans start this process of reconstruction, not necessarily united, but at the same time with the goal of reconstructing the nation. They passed acts like the Freedmen's Bureau that prevented starvation in the South for whites as well as blacks, oversight of contracts between emancipated people and plantation owners, and the operation of schools that would eliminate illiteracy. Johnson was impervious to the facts. From his point of view, this was a program that cost too much, and so he vetoed the legislation, and Congress did not have enough votes to override that veto. In the election of 1866, a larger Republican majority, that one that was veto-proof, came to D.C., and they passed the Civil Rights Bill. In the Constitution, it says that the Congress can define citizenship and basically what role citizens can play within the nation. And so Congress took that upon themselves to pass this Civil Rights Bill, the first Civil Rights Bill in U.S. history. Johnson vetoed it. This time Congress had the power to override the presidential veto, and it is the first example of the override of an executive uh, a presidential veto in U.S. history on a major piece of legislation. In almost all these cases, Johnson's advisors asked him, Sign the legislation. Support the legislation. It will help your election prospects. Johnson went his own way. And this was when we had the first stirrings of impeachment in Congress. The first investigation of Johnson was an investigation into his finances. That failed to result in a floor vote on impeachment. Congress instead decided that they would pass laws that would restrict the president's ability to maneuver. Uh, one was called the Military Con Reconstruction Act. It was a bill that established military districts in the South and gave military uh, generals the ability to enforce law in those areas. Uh, the military leaders could be replaced, and Johnson did replace some of those military leaders uh, with, with largely cronies that would not support full civil rights. Congress also passed the Tenure of Office Act that said that the president could not dismiss a cabinet member without the Senate's approval. And these two events basically formed trouble for Johnson because they caused a disruption to emerge between him and his generals, which had been relatively good prior to that. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, the uh, Civil War general, was still the main general for the Reconstruction Acts. 
Johnson decided to try and get rid of him as a political rival. It looked like Grant would run for president in 1868, and so Johnson proposed to send him with an ambassador to Mexico. The ambassador was a well-known boozer, and the assumption was that Grant would get around booze, would discredit himself, and not be able to run for president. When Johnson ordered Grant to Mexico, Grant said that it was a civilian position, and he, he was a military man, and he actually got so angry with the Secretary of State that he slammed his fist on the table and stated, no power on earth can compel me to do this, right? Which is a rather strong statement. Second, Johnson created a new military district of the Atlantic. The fear of many congressional members was that Johnson wanted an army close enough to protect him from removal from office. On February 21st, the impeachment of Johnson was sealed when he ordered the removal of Edmund Stanton. With a clear signal that Reconstruction was imperiled and that the president would defy Congress, impeachment swiftly passed the House of Representatives. And as Dr. Solberg pointed out, the House of Representatives has the sole power of impeachment. And that word sole, I think, is definitely chosen by the founders to say, this is where the, uh, that happens. Now, the winding road of Johnson's impeachment, it actually started in the Judiciary Committee uh, in 1866. It failed there. It went to the Reconstruction Committee. It failed there, and it was only the impeachment of Stanton where the Reconstruction Committee actually had enough votes to put it on the floor of Congress where it was actually passed. The House of Representatives passed 11 articles of impeachment. The first nine were rather legalistic, and they were really focused on that Tenure of Office Act and the firing of Stanton. The 10th and 11th I find a little more interesting because they had to do with the president degrading the presidency and not a specific act. I just want to quote from uh, these two uh, articles uh, that the House of Representatives uh, listed as impeachment articles. That said, Andrew Johnson, President of the United States, unmindful of the high duties of his office and the dignity and proprietaries thereof, designed and intended to set aside the rightful authority and powers of Congress, did attempt to bring into disgrace, ridicule, hatred, contempt, and reproach the Congress of the United States and the several branches thereof, and to impair and destroy the regard and respect of all good people of the United States for the Congress and legislative power thereof. It continues, but you get kind of the idea of, uh, of that impeachment article. And this kind of runs into the debate about impeachment uh, that uh, Dr. Nichols is going to talk about, about what the founders had in mind. I'll just say for the purposes of, of uh, my example here, um, the House managers, when they went to the Senate for the trial, decided that they would use a very narrow legalistic argument, that they would focus on the president and that Tenure of Office Act violation. And they lost that. Uh, Johnson remained in office, and they lost because they failed to convince all Republicans that Johnson's actions were worthy of removal. One thing that worked for Johnson, great lawyers. Presidents can hire the finest lawyers to defend them. But the second one was that 10 Republicans voted against removal. In other words, the Republicans were not united behind the removal of, uh, of Johnson. This presents one of the great what-ifs of history. Right? What if the argument at that time was that the president was thwarting or undermining the very purpose of the Civil War and what the country had stood for during that conflict? That would have required a broader discussion of what happened in Memphis and New Orleans. It would have required a discussion about the expansion of federal power to protect citizens' rights and the limitations of Jim Crow. Perhaps the impeachment still would have been lost. After all, those three northern states did reject uh, suffrage. And I should add that Oregon figures into this story a little bit too. In the election of 1868 that saw Ulysses S. Grant become president of the United States, Democrats swept into power into Oregon, and they rescinded the approval of the 14th Amendment of the United States, and they also prohibited interracial marriage. What's the grand lesson here? The grand lesson is that there's a difference between prosecuting cases in the Senate. The scope of the trial plays a role in the impeachment. In the example that I used, the managers went very narrow, very legalistic in their argument before the Senate. Uh, the Clinton uh, uh, impeachment, as Rory brought up, uh, was a much broader argument in front of the Senate. For the case of Johnson, um, 
because it was so narrow, it actually allowed the House manager, or excuse me, the um, presidential lawyers to argue that um, one violation of office should not be enough to remove a president, and that was enough to convince uh, some Republicans. The other thing that frequently comes up in our conversations about the trial in the Senate is the electability of the senators after the impeachment. While the Democrats are a mixed bag, and the ones who voted for impeachment are a mixed bag on the Republican side, there is a similarity amongst the 10 Republicans who voted to keep Johnson in office, and that is that none of them served in elective office again. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm tasked with somehow in 10 to 12 minutes uh, telescoping through everything that's going on right now um, and give you a little historical context as we do. So uh, the first thing I wanted to just hammer home is the question of what is impeachment itself? Just, re just crystal clear. All right, so the Constitution permits Congress to remove presidents before their term is up, as Professor Solberg said. Uh, if enough lawmakers vote to say that they committed, quote, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Just again, to hammer on the numbers, only two presidents have been impeached, neither has been removed, Nixon resigned before he could leave, uh, before he could be removed, forcibly, that is. Uh, so what's a high crime, what's a misdemeanor? We've talked about this a little bit, but this is the essence of the question in front of us as citizens uh, and those in Congress who are empowered to uh, deliberate this. It comes out of British common law, um, but what's more interesting for us in the moment is, I think, to turn back to the founders, think briefly about what they were so worried about and why that matters so much today, and from my perspective, that answers the question of why it's happening now. If you go to 1788, if you go to the uh, Constitutional Convention in 1787, you find some definitions of impeachment. You find some of the ways in which uh, the founders were debating this question. Um, in June, June 20th, 1787, you can go do it yourself. It's on Aval the Avalon site of Yale, and you can look at what Madison's notes say of exactly what everybody was talking about in terms of impeachment. Uh, if you go to the Federalist Papers, the most famous and best example of this is the 65th. It's Madison in 1788, and he lays it out. So anyone who's critiquing this in the present, from the right to the left, should go back to the sources and take a look at what people were actually saying when they wrote the damn Constitution. Uh, and what did they say? Well, uh, and, and Professor Solberg quoted part of this. Hamilton most famously said that impeach impeachment was for, quote, those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. Quote, they are of a nature which may, with peculiar propriety, be denominated political as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. So if you're hearing, and as we're talking about the history and the precedents and the ideas here, if you're hearing that you have to go beyond a reasonable doubt, or that there's some uh, legal standard for this, uh, there are laws involved, there are legal, there's legal thought process involved, there are legal analogies involved, but that's as far as that goes. And if you go back to Hamilton, you go back to Madison, they say this is a quote, national inquest related to injuries to the society itself, right? To, to violations of public trust. So it's inherently vague, but it is also specific in important kinds of ways, right? It isn't saying that this is a felony. It isn't shooting someone on Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm. All right, so why now? Well, my argument also from the founders, uh, and this is what got me doing a lot of commentary this, this summer, was that I went out on a limb for a historian, and I said, if there's gonna be impeachment, uh, my view, based on the history, is that it had to do with the foreign dimensions of this. That American domestic politics uh, are, are uh, as partisan as they've ever been, but fundamentally it's the foreign meddling in American politics that has been a bright red line in US political thought throughout all of US history. In fact, even before the revolution is over, this is a, a burgeoning problem for Federalists and Anti-Federalists. The rise of the party, the party system in the US is arguably as much due to worries about who will ally with Great Britain, with the English, and who will ally with the French as any other single issue. If that's true, and that, I would stipulate it is, and you can go to the sources and read it, then what follows is that the founders' arguably biggest worry was the role of foreign meddling in American politics. And that is still with us as a kind of primordial concept. So when you get a transcript of a president asking another foreign leader 
to provide information for domestic political gain, it's something that even the most hyper-partisan people can't avoid at least beginning to understand the impropriety of it. Because every other single elected official in US foreign policy history, at least, foreign policy thinkers, would have recognized that. Um, and so if you go back, one of the other fears of people like Hamilton, and here I'm quoting Federalist 68, is he actually argued for the Electoral College on the basis of it helping be a buffer between the people and elected officials who might be tools of foreign governments. As he argues in that, quote, the desire in foreign powers to gain improper ascendance in our councils uh, among the, quote, most deadly is among the most deadly adversaries of Republican government. His fear, he said, was that foreign powers would, quote, raise a creature of their own to the chief magistracy of the Union. So we go back and we can find example after example of this in U.S. foreign policy thought. The main worry was its domestic ramifications. The U.S. has foreign allies, gets aid from other countries, whatever's going on there. You can even argue that it's for good. It could turn out bad. There are, but the potential for unintended consequences uh, with American uh, politicians working with foreign powers is one that American politicians from the right, from the left, every party, uh, you can find these arguments. You can find them from American socialists, you can find them uh, from uh, American anarchists, in fact. These kinds of ties to foreign powers uh, sort of transcend America, or the worries of ties to foreign powers transcend parochial American politics in some ways. So if you go through this, uh, in the summer, this past summer, uh, you may recall that President Trump said he would accept or listen to, was his exact language, opposition research coming from foreign uh, powers and countries. It, what we didn't know at the time, but we, what we now know is that he was saying that same kind of thing uh, in secretly recorded tapes and in conversations with other foreign leaders. All right, so for me, that helps explain the foreign and these foundational concepts help, help explain why now and why it's so, so challenging for people who even want to be supporters of the president to make a a productive, positive case for this kind of engagement with the foreign power. So if you look to see what people on the right are saying, they're mostly dodging this question, and they're answering with other kinds of questions, procedural ones, uh, or uh, precedent-based ones. We've already heard about some of those kinds of things. There, nobody is saying, or virtually no one is saying, that it is okay to suborn foreign uh, intelligence for the purposes of domestic political gain. Um, so that's, I think, formative and important for us to consider. All right, but let's uh, think a little bit about who's implicated in this. If you think about previous impeachments, Watergate is a good example. We'd we'll be happy to talk more about that. One of the things that happens is this classic uh, formulation, right? The cover up is worse than the crime. What we're seeing in our drip, drip, drip these days, which is incredibly fast, is that all, lots and lots of other people are implicated. And this is important for those of us who study foreign relations because we know what these documents look like. Um, I've read hundreds, maybe thousands of telecons and memcons from presidents uh, talking to foreign leaders. Uh, the one that we got with Ukraine is an anomaly. And that's why uh, you know, nonpartisan foreign service officers and other folks, uh, whistleblowers, came forward. You just don't see this kind of document. And the only analogy, the only comparison I can give you is some things that, Nick, uh, that, um, that uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger said about um, selling out South Vietnamese allies in the war in Vietnam. Some pretty immoral kinds of conversations. They're very few. Um, and the fact that this one looks the way that it does in terms of an implicit quid pro quo, which I think is there, we can talk about that. I think the argument that a fate asking for a favor is anything other than reciprocal, um, it defies the logic of that definition. If I ask for a favor, right, there's a, at least an IOU is promised within that. Favors are reciprocal in some way. You don't give a favor expecting nothing ever, right? So but what, what's said in this? Um, so if we're thinking about why it matters, what these documents say. All right, so first off, um, the key concepts, and I'll just turn us to, to some of the text. So in the uh, Ukraine conversation, um, you had the president ask for a favor in return for an investigation of, um, of two things. So he had, uh, he asked, uh, he says first that uh, the US has been very, very good to the Ukraine, uh, direct quote. And then he goes on um, to, uh, to say uh, that um, the EU was not giving as much in terms of funding. Um, Vladimir uh, Zelensky, the newly elected president of Ukraine, in his conversation from June, uh, the day after the Mueller report came out uh, and the Mueller's testimony happened, um, Zelensky says uh, that, that Ukraine is uh, ready to buy some Javelin missiles. Uh, Congress in the fall of 2018 had approved 
first $250 million in security and military aid to Ukraine, and then uh, an additional package for them. Uh, it's up to the president and the Office of Management and Budget as to how they want to allocate that, and I could deal with the questions of that if you want a little later. Um, and so Zelensky's saying, I want to buy some of these weapons, we need these for defense. And uh, immediately thereafter in the conversation, uh, the president opens up by saying, I would like to ask for a favor of those. Um, which, uh, and then as he moves through, at the end of the conversation, he, he asks uh, for an investigation to Biden and says that Joe Biden was running around brag, quote, bragging about um, getting a prosecutor uh, out of office in Ukraine. Um, now, why this matters in terms of foreign policy and U.S. national security is that in 2014, there was a revolution in Ukraine. It, it threw out the uh, puppet of, of Russia, or a leader who is very pro-Russia, if, like, if you'd like to prefer that language, uh, and within just a month, uh, Russian troops, the so-called green helmets, people without any uh, direct insignia on their uniforms, rushed into Crimea and, and some other areas of the Ukraine, took over those places, forced a referendum uh, on the people of the Crimea. Uh, they had a very characteristic Soviet out, out turning uh, output, 87% I think came out, and 97% vote, uh, voted to join Russia. Uh, that this was coerced was something that every international organization agreed on. Uh, the, it is a majority, I think 60% of Crimea are, are Russian born and Russian speakers, but more are Russian speakers, almost 100%. Um, but this it, it was the first uh, land grab of this type uh, since World War II. So hugely significant in international relations. Um, and the US immediately, uh, in the Obama administration, pushed forward with sanctions uh, and tried to backstop Ukraine. Um, and as this rolls out, there's a, so there's a commitment from U.S. foreign policy from the Obama administration into the Trump administration to support the Ukraine. Um, and the other problem were levels of corruption, because even after this revolution in 2014, there was a significant amount of corruption within Ukrainian politics, largely around the energy and gas sector. Not a shock that we see a lot of people implicated in this through that. Um, and as that plays out, lots of uh, congressional Republicans were among the staunchest in pushing for this sanctions regime and military and security. They saw Ukraine as a real bulwark to NATO and to the West uh, and wanted very much to support um, Ukraine. So as a backstory, then what you would expect in a conversation like the one that we now have the rough transcript of is a president talking about security concerns, uh, how, the, how, um, how the aid will be used, uh, what sorts of ways um, we might better be able to, the U.S. might better be able to assist Ukraine in their ongoing war, which is ongoing um, and an ex existential crisis for that state, right? They've already had a, the, their significant piece uh, of, of uh, port facilities annexed, and they're in a conflict. So if you think about what's in the backstory of this conversation, you need that context, right? The context is this is a country that's uh, at war, and the U.S. president is asking for something relatively small. But that relatively small thing is something that throughout U.S. political history has been out of bounds. That relatively small thing is illegal, fundamentally, if not practically, because it's suborning foreign aid uh, and abuse of power, abuse of the, his office as commander in chief. Why do I say that? A president as commander in chief has great power in these kinds of conversations to push other countries without making a formal request even. It's all in the subtext and the context. What's going on in Ukraine? Why do they need this aid? Who is this new person? A newly elected president trying to establish his, his position with a country that's under attack. And what does he want out of it? Among other things, he wants Russia to see that the US and the Ukraine have a very strong relationship because it's Russian proxies and Russians themselves who are fighting the war. So the, so the concern here in this conversation is one that I think, I hope I've painted uh, uh, the picture of, is one that um, NSC National uh, Security Council staffers and CIA agents who really know the area would be, it would be a blinking red light, it's sort of kind of a shock to have a president not address the security and military concerns, but instead to go to domestic political questions. And, and that's leaving out the kind of conspiracy theory about Ukraine-based hacking, uh, uh, of, with related to Democrats hacking Democrats to make it look like Russia had hacked the 2016 election, which we could also talk about if you'd like to. Um, but the point being um, uh, that the, then the whistleblowers uh, transcript, which we now have, which is the secretly uh, then now, class, now declassified uh, document, um, is another piece of this. So this is a person who had not been on that conversation and had not seen the transcript 
who was able to explain uh, another piece of this story. And this will be the piece where I more or less leave it. We, we can talk more in our Q&A about this. So what happens with that, uh, with the whistleblower? And we now know that there's at least one more who's being represented by the same lawyer. Uh, and we know that the, the people now implicated in this uh, include the vice president, the secretary of state, the attorney general, uh, several personal lawyers or lawyers aides for the president. Uh, and a number of other players within the orbit of the presidency. I was making a list. This is how long the list is of people who are implicated. I couldn't even read it in, my, in whatever time I've left. So, the, so thinking about the whistleblower piece, uh, whistleblower laws uh, largely derive out of um, the 1970s. Uh, they go farther back, but uh, the, the point here is that if you take your career uh, at, at great risk to come out with this kind of information, and um, when you look through that document, it's like a roadmap to impeachment. And pretty likely that's what this whistleblower intended, I would, I, I would assume, I would suggest. Um, and if you, as you go through that document, you see mo lots of moments of obstruction. So when we go back to Johnson, if we go back to Nixon, if we go to Clinton, the classic article of impeachment, the one that trips up presidents every time, is obstruction of justice. And the case here is pretty rock solid that after the Ukraine conversation happened, the, everybody who heard it knew this was a problem. They s snuck it away to a secret server uh, that's highly classified, a code word server, where it does not belong by dint of classification. It only belongs there because of the political repercussions of the problem. I've spoken to several former ambassadors and friends who are National Security Council, uh, were on the National Security Council. They all agree they never saw this in any administration in which they served just is a bridge too far. And that's what the whistleblower was documenting, among other things, this level of obstruction. And there are lots more levels in there. The other thing we've heard in the critique, which I find, frankly, perplexing, go to the sources, they're all out there. The whistleblower's uh, concerns are almost entirely corroborated by what we now know publicly. So the argument that the whistleblower was off base, I mean, this is a document rich with footnotes, uh, uh, publicly accessible information, as well as classified information. It makes a really rich account of exactly what happened and why it's problematic. And I, I would return to one other piece of that and what's going on today. Uh, several senior people in the State Department have resigned, one very senior person. In part, it's because the Secretary of State is not defending Foreign Service folks. Um, the, the ambassador to Ukraine who was pushed out, Marie uh, Yukonovich, who just testified, she uh, was clearly pushed out because she did not want to pursue what we heard in the phone call, what we know from what was said in the phone call. Um, and because of that, uh, you have widespread ramifications in the career foreign service in the U.S., which uh, I'd love to talk more about. But one thing that's really important about American government is that it is nonpartisan. The vast majority of people in politics, in, in, within government uh, operations, are actively nonpartisan. And so the, what they expect is that the political appointees who are part of this process will have their back because um, no one else will, fundamentally. One of the major uh, advents in US political and foreign policy history has been uh, the civil service reform to make sure that we have great civil servants uh, and who, have, uh, who, have in, who will not be punished for taking um, in, into account their oath of office rather than the particular vicissitudes of different politics and different administrations. That's a huge part of this question, and it's why we're very likely to hear whistleblower after whistleblower and leak after leak, because not having the support of political appointees who run these bureaucracies is the number one way that you lose uh, the war of information which we see in 2019 is so crucial for this. So I'm gonna leave it at that because I wanna get us moving from it. Thank you. Well, it's always fun, but also intimidating to be on a panel of uh, people whose profession actually involves relying on facts and being able to document and footnote them. I live in a world that does not, and that, frankly, is the world of people that will be making decisions about what happens moving forward. The question that the process, as it was described earlier, is incredibly important. There are no rules. The rules are determined by the people who sit today in the Congress. So to begin to anticipate what will happen, you have to understand what are the influences, what are the pressures on those individuals, and how are those different than the pressures that have been on those individuals in prior circumstances that we've heard about today. And probably the key thing that changes those influences is the rise of social media, 
the decline of a non-biased, fact-based media on any side of an issue, and how quickly a new cycle moves. And I want to go through those um, in a, a variety of different ways. The first is that if a member of Congress is sitting there today, heading this weekend into their town hall, knowing that their constituents are going to ask them what they think about this idea of impeaching the president. The decision that each member of Congress will make about what they say depends very much on where they live. Those who are going home to reliably blue types of districts, like AOC, are going to be very easily able to say, we should do this, we should have done it a long time ago, there's absolutely no question, and all the people in the room will stand up and cheer. Those who are in more swing kinds of districts, like Congressman Schrader in our own um, CD5, who was one of the last uh, Democrats to sign on, is going to wait and see how the communication from his district starts to shift over time. He wants to know, not are people going to stand up and cheer, but who is going to run against him, either from inside his own party, because he doesn't act fast enough to sign on to this idea of impeaching or removing a president, or secondly, because he has violated the will of the people by moving forward to invalidate the, the votes of many of the members of his own district that elected him. People that probably have the most difficult time this week are those who are going home to more solidly or leaning red districts. And that's because all of a sudden, the many different elements that are influencing a policymaker are coming into to conflict. The first is the question of law. Does Congress have, have the right to begin an impeachment inquiry? Does Congress have the right to file orders of impeachment? Absolutely. Is that politically tenable for some people? Yes. What is my ambition? What do I want to be next? If I do not stand with the president, will my friends still be there for me? Who has stood with me in the past that I'm willing to betray by, by stepping forward and saying vocally, clearly, I am going to agree with impeaching someone of my own party? On top of that, what is that going to do to my voters who voted for this president? and many of whom still believe that was the right vote. Public opinion depends on where people live in this country because we have had such a decline in local newspapers, local radio, local television, that the loudest voices in Congress are those that get covered the most. There are some members of Congress that can go back to their districts and have very little ever tweeted about what they've said, what they've done. Very few people ever ask, have you taken a stand? Where are you? As things start to heat up, those individuals who are not used to being in the spotlight are all of a sudden having to calculate how they answer those questions. For some of these individuals that are really torn with party loyalty, they also have to start to worry about their legacy. Will I be a person that upheld what some will eventually say was my constitutional duty? Or will I be seen as a person who caved to political pressure and jumped too soon off of the ship of my party so that I wouldn't face criticism from others? All of this comes back to the idea that every member of Congress has gotten there in the same way. They were elected by the people. And if you are talking about removing the President of the United States from office, that is a very consequential thing. You are asking members of Congress to overturn the will of the Electoral College. So when we look at the issues that have come up before the issue of Ukraine, and I think this is something that's really key around why it has to be a foreign policy issue, the issues that others have said are impeachable were litigated in the prior election. Are there questions around sexual assault, treatment of women, treatment of people with disabilities? Is the president a likable person? People came to different conclusions about that. However, there was an election and there was a result. That issue was already litigated. Immigration. The president began his campaign very clear about where he stood on the issue of a wall of immigration of people of color. That issue was litigated and he was elected president. 
The president was very clear about who he was going to nominate to the Supreme Court bench. People talked about that, it was debated, it was, it was litigated, and he was elected. It was not until we get, and then you have the Mueller report, which for many people seemed like enough because it's this question of obstruction of justice. And I think going back to the earlier presentation, this seems like something for a lot of people that can fit into that idea of, oh, that's a misdemeanor, that's a crime. Obstruction of justice, it sounds very, very official. But in the court of public opinion, in the stable of tweets that are landing in the staff offices of all of these members of Congress, depending on where you live, that is either a very important report about interference from a foreign government that was aided by a political candidate for the, pres for the presidency that then used his power to shut down an investigation into that, or a really expensive and very public demonstration of sour grapes that people can't get over the fact that they lost an election. That, again, was not enough. It's my belief that that, again, is why we are where we are today. For Nancy Pelosi, um, who many people have expressed frustration with, why would she not come forward before this point to ask for articles of impeachment? You can't. The other thing that leaders are looking at is strategy. What is it that will work? Nothing until this point even had a chance of, of working, of pulling along um, other members of Congress that sit on the other side of the aisle or members of the public. Members of the public can understand the idea that foreign policy is something that should unite most of us. Most Americans understand the idea that we want to believe that the United States stands with the little guy, that we will not withhold the tools to respond to some sort of an existential crisis in, in exchange for a political favor. I think what you've seen over the course of the last few days is a bipartisan um, sense of being stunned about uh, the decisions related to the Kurds and the idea of betraying individuals uh, that have stood with Americans in the past. It's though that type of level of concern that pushes the electorate to better understand why they might trust their Congress to overturn the decision that they made just a few years ago. Now the other piece that is incredibly important to keep in mind is that just over 12 months from now, actually just about 12 months from now in Oregon, you're gonna get your ballots um, because your vote by mail ballot is gonna land in your mailbox about exactly this time next year. And the postage will be paid, that's pretty exciting. Um, really happy about that. But the, the election, is coming, and that's not just an election to the president, that is an election for Congress. So when you get back to the strategy, you have to think about where is this going to unfold and what does it mean for the, the trajectory of the nominations for the presidency uh, for the general election next fall. If you are Donald Trump and you are holding on there is a point, if these leaks keep coming, that the pressure to him from his base will be to step aside and let it go away so they can focus on a viable alternative to run on the Republican ticket. If he chooses not to do this, and this extends for a number of months past Super Tuesday, past, um, you know, into the spring, and you end up having a long list of people who have been implicated, all of a sudden for the Republican Party, there is a significant challenge of who has the opportunity, who has the ability to amass the support and the money necessary to run a successful presidential bid in November. And for those members of Congress, how many of them might get pulled down from making the wrong choice about impeachment? And that is a question that also has to be weighing heavily in the minds of the Democrats as well, because the news cycle is very fast. We can be tricked. We can believe that our eyes are not seeing what our eyes think that they are seeing. And the whims and our beliefs, our collective beliefs as expressed on social media, as shouted on the news shows every night, can change in, the, in just the, the blink of an eye. So every member of Congress is going to be concerned about that. Because ultimately, what Congress is being asked to do, if they are to remove a president, 
is to invalidate the very process that got them the job that they hold today and that they will rely on to return to that seat that they enjoy. And I would imagine that that might be why, if you look at those who have been successfully removed from office through an impeachment process, those are federal judges. It's a different question. We aren't invalidating that process. So I am um, pleased that I don't have to make these decisions right now. Um, and I thank you for um, I have some questions that arrived via email, so we'll start with those and then we'll sort through the cards to see what we have. Um, but one of the questions that stands out to me, it's one that I've been um, trying to figure out information about this week as well, um, is uh, someone questioned, what power does Congress have to compel cooperation by the executive branch? Circumstances usually Congress um, often wins in the lower courts. They haven't, again, gotten to the Supreme Court that much, but I imagine that this one will. Sure. Um, I was that. saying to Professor Schulberg before this that I spent a lot of a weekend diving down into uh, subpoena power, the history of subpoena power. Um, and one thing we've heard a lot about is that uh, different um, impeachments, uh, for instance, um, Nixon and Clinton, had different subpoena power questions and bipartisanship issues. And I think that's a legitimate question. Um, but it's very historically contingent, which means um, the House committees under Nixon, in the Nixon impeachment needed to have a collective vote to empower those committees to use their subpoena power and to take depositions uh, and uh, to do fuller investigations. Um, this was also true in the Clinton era, but what's most important if you think about those two moments is they both had special prosecutors or independent counsels who issued most of the subpoenas, grand jury subpoenas. So this moment is unlike those. If you hear somebody saying this is just like that, the same rules should apply, it's not true. It's not historically accurate. So there, there's no current special counsel. Uh, special counsel law has changed fundamentally anyway. Um, and in fact, uh, one the main thing that's changed under uh, Republican leadership in 2015 was they made House subpoena votes uh, a majority rule. And so the chairs of committees can decide who gets to give subpoenas or not. Um, and when it was good for them, they liked that. And now we've seen this uh, criticism that now that it isn't good for them, they should go back to the, di the standards of different eras, which I would argue also don't apply because they're not similar. Uh, so there's two reasons that that logic is flawed. The other piece that's really interesting, it's not since 1934-35 that the, that the um, capital jail has been used. Um, and if you look at subpoena history, and I don't know if this is perfectly accurate, but it's hard to find. It does not look like the fine power, which is the uh, ability to co compel through testimony or presence or documents through fines, has been used by House committees uh, in any significant way. Um, so you hear some Democratic members of Congress saying they, they like the idea of using uh, large-scale fines. I think they can find up to 100,000. Um, but uh, that hasn't been tested, hasn't been used, at least not at the highest level. Uh, and that, So we'll have to see how that uh, uh, unfolds, both politically and legally. is the legislative and executive branches are co-equal to each other, but there are also checks on each other's power. When these two roles are in conflict, which, which role has the courts historically given, de given deference to? Like me again. Um, <laughs> it really depends on the, the context of the question. If you're just talking about overall conflicts of power, um, uh, when the president maybe you know, trying to think of an example, and I won't be able to offhand. Um, generally speaking, um, the Supreme Court has been extraordinarily deferential to executive power. Right, so the president generally wins. This is one of the reasons why the presidency has grown at the expense of Congress, um, really in the modern era. But what we're talking about here is something different, right? It's not um, just a question of executive power. It's it, 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 it's a, a conflict of a congressional um, constitutional authority, uh, a delegated authority from the Constitution, um, a direct power, so to speak, versus an implied power of the president, this idea of executive privilege. 
that all communications for the president and then by extension, given again what President Trump has, <coughs> has um, said, he's going to do, right? All communications. So he's not even just talking about communications between himself and his advisors. He's not talking about just reports or advising the president. He's talking, he's trying to privilege discussions between, you know, two State Department officials in Ukraine, right? And, and between the ambassador to the UN and a State Department official, right? So he's going way beyond. There's several different types of executive privilege. And he's blanketing all of it and wrapping it all up in, you know, in his blanket and you know, putting it over his shoulder and saying, I'm taking it, you know, taking my marbles and going home. Um, and in these situations, what we have seen is presidents have not had much luck when they try to expand in this way. President Clinton tried it with the Paula Jones trial to say, no, 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 you can't, you know, there's executive privilege over documents and also you can't try me because I'm president and the courts allowed some things, but not the claims of executive privilege from when he wasn't president. Um, and again, lower courts and previous examples um, suggest strongly that if the president is absolutely, you know, defying the will of Congress, and Congress can show the need, as in we are in the middle of an impeachment hearing, courts have been deferential under those circumstances to allow. Right? What they said in the Nixon tapes, which is, is not exactly analogous, a lot of people will try to make it analogous, but it's not exactly analogous because in the Nixon tape case, what was at issue was the use of those tapes in a criminal trial. Right? But the, I think, precedent holds, which was what the Supreme Court said, is that you know, allowing a breach of executive privilege under these circumstances is not going to be the slippery slope of awfulness for a presidency because we actually shouldn't need, quite frankly, is what the court said, it, it, yeah, paraphrasing, um, to often uh, gain documents or gain testimony when a president abuses power or when a president is involved in a criminal conspiracy. Like that just shouldn't happen. Therefore, allowing um, Congress to compel these documents won't be a problem in the future because essentially what the court was saying in the 70s was presidents shouldn't do this. Um, now, the court right now is very much you know, split five to four um, with Republican appointees and Democrat appointees. It's the first time that the split of five to four of liberals and conservatives has aligned also with um, partisan affiliation. Um, and we've got several members of that conservative majority who are um, very amenable to executive power. But if, um, and, and, and I can't take credit for this analysis, but I'm trying to remember where I heard it, but there's, there, there's another sort of layer to it. If, A, if the president is saying, no, I'm not gonna give Congress the documents, then you've got that chick mark where, where, where the court is gonna be moved away potentially from the, the, the concerns about um, you know, executive power to thinking about congressional power and, and how they will look in history if they allow the presidency to grow that large. But also, in all likelihood, if this case is up before the Supreme Court, that means some lower courts have ruled, and in all likelihood, the president has also ignored what the lower courts have said. Then implicates judicial power. President isn't all, isn't just ignoring Congress; he's ignoring the judiciary. And if there's one thing that, and, and I shouldn't, I, I'll I'll be brave like Chris and go out on a limb. If there's one thing that John Roberts, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, is not going to like, is someone trying to eviscerate the judicial power. Right. And you see some of that also. You can look back to some of the cases during the Nixon administration, and the Burger Court was also very. Um, concerned about about judicial power. Um, so, if Trump continues in sort of this like all-in strategy, um, I don't think that he'll find the, the favor that he's assuming he's going to get at the courts. Let's see how wrong I am in the in January, maybe February. I think that.
back a little bit further in history to the 1600s, uh, right? The historian making a, making a play here. Um, so in the 1600s, there was a series of civil wars that were in Britain, and the question over whether or not a monarch could be removed had never really been answered. In fact, it was assumed that no, a monarch could not be removed. And the leader of England was killed, and everybody agreed, yeah, bad guy deserved to be killed, but the question was, was it legal or not? And this influenced some of the founders when they were writing the Constitution about removal of the executive. And so that's why they wrote into Article I powers, the House of Representatives will have the sole responsibility uh, of making the charge, and then the Senate will, will hear it. It has the sole responsibility for that, to make sure that that was legal and where that power would be uh, housed as part of the balance of power in the U.S. government. <laughs> Just in the 1970s, presidents should not do this. I, that is one of the things I've thought a, a lot about over the last several months. When we ask to have power over a branch of government or an elected person, we try to figure out where in a constitution or where in a statute it says that you can hold somebody accountable for doing that thing. The problem is that we see more and more people doing things that nobody ever imagined that people would do. For those of you who are students, um, perhaps your parents have said to you, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do something. As a parent, I have said that a lot of times. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a law against it. And I think that is partly what was so <coughs> concerning about the phone call and what caused such alarm among so many people. How do you legislate? How do you create a statute where that is a violation of a statute, where that is a crime? for something that nobody imagined someone would ever do. In the end, our democracy is built on people. We have people that are supposed to assess the goodwill, the ideas, the character of the individuals that we choose to represent us. As we continue to have less and less credible information, we know less about the people that we are putting there to serve us. And it makes me wonder how much longer we can continue to rely on the goodwill of people putting the oaths that they take when they assume the office ahead of their own ambition, ahead of their own party or community loyalties. And that's what we see more and more often. It becomes more like a series of football teams rather than a set of people looking at how do we build strong communities and protect the interests of our country. data point on this that I've talked to a bunch of conservatives about. Um, it, it embedded in your comment was this question, well, what kind of, what's a crime? Um, and, and from my perspective, what I was talking about earlier, why were so many people in national, national security so upset about this? Because they're really worried about uh, federal campaign election and election laws, because this is right at the line of illegal. Um, I mean, I, I can quote you the, the code, right? There's a absolute uh, prohibition against, it shall be unlawful for a foreign national directly or indirectly to make a contribution or donation of anything of value. Now, the De Department of Justice said the request for information and investigations against or relating to the things that President Trump said in this call did not constitute a thing of value. But that is very much under debate in legal communities because a thing of value can be information. It has also been ruled that. So for instance, there, there's case law about this with Canadian polling firms giving free polling help to American politicians at the border. And they have been seen, at, that has been judged to be an illegal campaign contribution. You have to expect that an investigation in a country like Ukraine would be similar by a, by say, a, a clear-eyed, nonpartisan Department of Justice evaluation. And that's why national security people were so freaked out when they heard this. Because they're like, the president is, is asking for an illegal act for his own campaign. Who holds him accountable? People who've taken these oaths, whistleblowers, but they can't say anything. And that's why the people in charge were so nervous, uh, because this is right at that line of a crime. So when folks say, is this a crime? Isn't it a crime? I'd say, go to American uh, election law, and, and you will find right there the definition of foreign national contributions to elections, this as a case in point. Right, but again, we have to remember that 
it doesn't actually have to be a crime no. to be impeachable. And to invite foreign governments into our elections right, is what I think a lot of folks are saying is yeah. a breach of public trust. Yeah. Which is different than a crime and breaks down norms. And once we break down these norms, they don't come back. So we are at time, but I want to first of all thank our panelists for um, sharing with us today.